There's a very beautiful story narrated by, you know, the social historian of, of piracy, Peter Leinbaum, in which he speaks of a custom. If it was imminent that a ship was going to sink because of very bad weather, <clears throat> everyone in the ship would get together and break the locks that were there on the barrels of, of the, you know, of the, the casks of wine or of rum and drink together, temporarily suspending relationships of master, owner, you know, uh, captain, slave, etc. Because it was imminent that they were all going to die. But what they were suspending really was the logic of private property. Right? In this kind of moment where all of a sudden there's a carnivalesque celebration just before you know, death or what they envisage to be inevitable death. And he, <coughs> Peter Leinborg narrates an interesting, I mean, interesting stories of a number of communities who were formed by you know, an, an act of divine intervention where after the celebration of this kind of you know, temporary autonomous zone of property, the ships actually didn't sink. And they ended up you know, in, in, in islands or, or in places where all of a sudden, you know, once you had already suspended, even for a brief moment, the logic of private property, what is the term or what are the terms through which you will then create a new community? And this is a very interesting metaphor for our contemporary because this is a time when all of a sudden, after having survived, they clearly couldn't go back to you know, an older logic where property determined social relations. And they created for themselves temporary communes which celebrated the idea of commoning, which celebrated you know, uh, 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 or, or returned themselves to a, a memory of the commons all of which were brutally crushed. And piracy has its roots in this particular history. In the same way that if you look at the contemporary, where the emergence of piracy as a mode of, you know, of, of, of circulation and distribution of knowledge, etc., it is not so much the fact that the Phantom Menace is downloaded 500 times or 600 times, etc., yeah, of course, there is you know, an imaginary specter of economic loss that informs that. But the real battle or the real threat lies in a shift in the ways that we think of the possibilities, when we think of the shift of the possibilities of ourselves as creators and not merely as consumers, as writers, filmmakers, photographers, etc. And I think that is really, really where it, the danger lies because if the imagination of global mass media is dependent on a particular kind of relationship between production, circulation, and consumption. Now, this is where the rules are being changed altogether. The fact that the DVD writer is the new weapon of mass destruction in the world is primarily for the fact that a $50 billion film can be reproduced at the cost of, let's say, 10 or 15 cents on a DVD. Now, you have a strange paradox here. You have a situation where, you know, in some senses, the, 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 the ability to even think of ourselves, you know, sitting on our computers with a DVD writer as competition to a $535 billion industry is not science fiction anymore. And it's really the, the ability to think of the possibilities, you know, that have happened. Earlier, people were happy with reproducing the DVD. Then people started looking for their favorite scenes and archiving it. And then people who were not happy with the scenes decided that they would you know, make parodies and remix some of these scenes. And then people realized that they had a better film in their head, which they could make. And they could, of course, use some bits of the existing film. So the, the possibilities really became endless. I think the example that highlights the, you know, the, the gap between the possible and the proscribed is really in, in terms of, you know, let's say, um, filmmakers who are suddenly, you know, making films outside of the logic of the studio, outside of the logic of the industrial mode of production, which demands that a film is a particular kind of cultural commodity that is manufactured in a particular kind of manner. And an example of this is, you know, a, a filmmaker called Jonathan Cowart, who made a film called Tarnation, uh, which used home video, clips from other sources, etc., uh, and all of this for $280. When the film was thought to be distributed because it made a splash in independent film festivals, and when 
they try to distribute the film and, and try to get you know uh, copyright permissions from the different owners of copyright. The sh budget of the film suddenly shot to eight hundred thousand dollars. Right again, one cannot speak about the gap between the possible and the prescribed without actually looking at what exists between the two. And what exists between the two are legal fictions backed by extreme capabilities of violence. So it's a terrorism of the mind that actually sustains concepts like intellectual property. You know, it's, it's a terrorism that's grounded on an idea of a brutal repression of that which is actually possible. You know, so what actually lies therefore between the two is in some senses, you know, the bare, naked idea of sovereignty and authority and power linked to the service of property. I think what we need to, to, to start imagining for the 21st century is to create a museum of all the lost objects, cultures, thought, poetry, music, lost cultures in the sense that the, the, <clears throat> the, the kind of cultural commodities that could have been created, the kind of practices that could have been initiated had it not been for the law. I think it's time to create a, a similar museum of this sort, which memorializes the loss of culture created by the enforcement of property, the loss of cultures created by the boundaries of, of the law. And this museum would look very interesting because it would be partly, you know, it would be part Marquez, part Kafka, a bit of Borges, and a lot of, you know, kind of very, very gray, murky Proust in between, you know. And so let's start thinking of ways in which we we have lost, but the time is also not to lament because the 21st century is marked by the possibilities that, that in some senses, these museums are also being archived. There, there are these museums that people have, have, have you know, secretly created in their personal space. And it's just the ability now of these museums to speak to each other you know, and, and, and come together in a sense where we can retrieve these lost cultural commodities or objects, you know, where they no longer lost them, but they actually found. So I think it's time to find our place of culture in the 21st century and forget, you know, our lament for this kind of the loss that took place in the 19th and the 20th century. <laughs>